quantum mechanical model of the atom. So Bohr's model works well, Bohr Rutherford model, um, but the placement of the electrons for Bohr model uh, works well for atoms with one electron. But what they found was that as you get to larger atoms, it doesn't work as well. Um, and in order to get a more full picture of how um, these electrons are actually found around the nucleus, we had to get into some quantum mechanics in terms of describing what those electrons are actually like. And the fact that they are wave-like in nature um, really helped us along with explaining the details of the quantum mechanical model. So first one to actually consider electrons not just as particles was Louis de Broglie and um, he considered those electrons as waves themselves so looking at um, the idea that uh, light can act as both a particle and a wave um, if you can apply that to electrons then electrons we can think of as acting like a particle but also having wave-like properties so de Broglie considered electrons orbitals as circular standing waves. So if we think of a standing wave, we have these waves that can actually exist. So they exist along a point. And then we have a wavelength that can exist like so. Um, and so if we considered an electron acting like that standing wave, um, then we can say, okay, well, maybe some of the behaviors of electrons is due to their wave-like nature. So one of the things we know about electrons that uh, uh, that Bohr showed us was that they have specific energy levels in which they can exist. Why they had the, only those particular ones was not explained by Bohr, um, but that they do was apparent. And so thinking of them as waves explains that. So de Broglie thinking that these electrons could have, say, a full wavelength or two full wavelengths or three full wavelengths, um, if they're to exist as a standing wave, then they'd have to have those complete increments. They could not have, say, three quarters of a wavelength or one and a tenth of a wavelength. It has to be these exact multiples. And therefore, they can only exist in these exact spots. So if we think of these wavelengths as not existing um, linearly, but instead, for now, existing two-dimensionally around the nucleus, so think not of the circles are where the electrons are traveling as little orbits that the dots go around like the planetary Bohr Rutherford model would have you suggest but instead think of the waves existing as a wavelength along those points and so the inner what we would have called an orbit before um, it could say be the one wavelength um, amount of energy then if you were to go to two wavelengths the electron can't exist in between those two it can it exist in the one wavelength energy or the two wavelength energy, if it were to be anywhere in between, it would not meet up with itself on the other side of the circular orbit, um, and it would actually cancel itself out, it interfere and destroy itself. So if it is there, it does exist, and therefore it has not destroyed itself. So it is existing in these full wavelength increments, which correspond to the energy levels that we see um, as given off by the evidence. Remember, Bohr's model is a model, the line spectra are the actual evidence. And so Bohr's model agrees with the line spectra, but doesn't fully explain everything about what the electrons are doing. Thinking of the electrons as having those energy levels, but instead of being just particles, also having this wave-like characteristic that Roy is saying um, explains some of their nature better. So these standing waves can only have wavelengths that are multiples of whole numbers. Otherwise, they would cease to exist. Then, um, atoms aren't two-dimensional, so Schrodinger actually did the work in terms of figuring out what these waves would look like in three dimensions, and we're not getting anywhere close to thinking about the math involved in this, um, but essentially this gives you a wave equation which um, sort of is a depiction of where the electron is most likely to be found. So it's kind of like going back all the way to Rutherford's idea where the electron is somewhere and we don't really know where, um, but it's in this particular area. So instead of thinking of it as a planet orbiting the nucleus, like, like uh, with a Bohr-Rutherford model, what we're now thinking about is sort of more probabilistically in terms of there's gonna be a certain area where the electrons are more likely to be found. And these agree with the 
idea that there are these particular energies, but we don't know exactly where the electrons are within those spots. So instead of thinking of the Bohr-Rutherford model and saying, okay, there's the electron right there, I can draw a little dot. Um, what we're going to start thinking about is, okay, there are these regions where the electrons are most likely to be found. So these, this gives us the quantum mechanical model of the atom, um, and these sort of relate to the electron's orbitals, but they're, they're not orbitals, they're not little tracks that the electrons move through. They are spaces around where they're most likely to be found. And they describe the characteristics that we see, things like ionization energy, better than the oversimplified Bohr-Rutherford model could. So Schrodinger model describes not just hydrogen's electrons and where they would be, but it works for all of the elements. Um, and so therefore we can explain a lot more properties of the elements based on what their electrons are doing using these uh, quantum mechanical models developed by Schrodinger. So we'll go over how this all works, but just getting into the idea of what it is, is that um, there are certain rules defining where it's possible to find these electrons. And if we can sort of figure out what these rules are, then we can describe which elements have their electrons in certain places and use that to explain their properties. We're going to be using this um, system to describe this called quantum numbers is what that says. Um, and once we figure out how these quantum numbers work, it's like the location of where these would be. These are essentially um, the diagrams of some of the ones that we're going to be using. And so again, it's trying to draw them, draw them three to three dimensionally and represent where the electrons are instead of as the nucleus with a little circle around it and say, okay, there's the electron there for hydrogen. Um, what it's saying is it's going to exist in a probabilistical three-dimensional area around the nucleus, but depending on which energy level you're talking about, that area can change shape. And we'll have a set of rules to describe how that all works. So to summarize, we start with Dalton with the billiard ball model, one solid sphere, nothing too exciting going on there, but pretty big idea that matter is made up of particles and it's not just the four elements but there's many of them. Thompson then incorporated electrons in. Unfortunately he didn't get the nucleus part figured out but Rutherford did. Unfortunately he didn't get the electron part figured out but Bohr did for a good portion in terms of um, at least getting the, the different energy levels figured out but not being able to explain all the details within those energy levels. De Broglie added in that those electrons aren't just particle-like, but they also have wave-like nature, which would explain why we see particular spots um, where the electrons are, or energy levels where the electrons are that Bohr saw. And then we had Schrodinger who then elaborated on that and said, okay, well, that's just two-dimensional waves, uh, but they're actually these three-dimensional probability graphs where the electrons could be found. And once we get the rules figured out for how those are determined, we can describe in more detail where the electrons are around certain elements and therefore why they have the properties that they do.